If you've been following the channel for a while, you've probably seen a lot of different videos in a lot of different languages and platforms and frameworks and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, so I just want to let you know what you should look for in 2025 from me. Um, I've been on a quest to narrow down the languages that I use for specific purposes. And I, I think I'm really close. <laughs> so I want to show you what those are. And the key takeaway for you here is that in 2025, these are mostly what you're going to be seeing for me in terms of videos. If new things come out that really catch my interest or I think are worth talking about and teaching about, um, I will take the opportunity to do those things as well. But uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of been all over the place with languages in the past on my video and in my blog too. Um, so I am trying to narrow it down a bit and I think I'm finally at a really good spot. So let's talk about it. So I essentially have four different domains that I want to solve for. I want to solve for mobile. I want to solve for uh, general purpose. I want to solve for CLIs and similar. So smaller applications that may or may not have a GUI. Um, what else? We have mobile, general purpose, CLIs, embedded, and web. Uh, so I maybe we should add one more category, and I'm not entirely sure how to do that. Add a row below. Okay, perfect. Great. So this one is going to be uh, servers. Okay, so that's the gist. Uh, these are the categories. I said four. It actually ends up being about six. Um, but I'm, I think these are pretty encompassing categories for me. And I'll talk a little bit about how I use each of these as well, so you get a general idea. I'm going to move embedded to the end because it's the one that I am probably going to talk about the least. So let's do that. Okay, so we have some options. Don't consider this a tier list. I know I'm using tier maker. There's no tier here. This is just a form of categorization and it's something A, people are comfortable with and B, really easy to use. Uh, okay, so for mobile, uh, it's Dart. It, it is hands down Dart. So you should expect more Dart videos from me, more Flutter videos from me. And if things go really well, I don't think I can clone these, can I? I cannot. Uh, it will, Dart will also be a general purpose language for me. Um, we'll see how that goes. Dart and Flutter are really coupled together. Uh, not, not technically, but from a mindset perspective. So, um, I, I think Dart's a fantastic language. It's one of my favorite languages I've ever used. And, uh, you can use it for more than just Flutter. You can, I've made CLIs with it. I've made servers with it. Um, I really, really like it. So the, the main issue for me with Dart and taking it everywhere is a i feel like at this current state i am uh lobotomizing my hiring potential should i ever need to find a new job uh but b um the community is just not there for dart anywhere outside of flutter don't get me wrong some people are doing things and it's really great uh shelf is like a micro framework type thing i've built a sort of alternative slash competitor to shelf that's a little bit more involved called steward um i've built a cli library called boson I have recently been humbled by uh, some CLI libraries in the Zig community, so I maybe might need to revisit that at some point soon and maybe uh, make sure it is providing a really elegant experience like some of the Zig ones are. Um, but yes, I, you won't see me doing mobile stuff outside of Flutter anytime soon. Um, I, I just can't imagine anything coming up and taking my attention away from Flutter on the mobile side. And if you're unfamiliar with Flutter, it doesn't have to just be for mobile. You can use it for web as well. You can compile out web. You can compile out desktop applications. There's even an opportunity to use it on small uh, microcontroller. I hesitate to say embedded because embedded to me means very, very small resources. Um, and I, I don't think that's necessarily the intent. But in theory, you can. Uh, it just depends on the resources that are allocated for that embedded device. Anyways, so Flutter, Dart, mobile. Dart, general purpose, maybe even servers, depending on where things go. The language is kind of trying to remove reflection and instead trying to move towards macros. Uh, there's some community provided tooling called Build Runner that does some code gen, like handling code gen type stuff at the build time for you. It is a mess. I do not care for it. Um, but if we were to get first party support for macros, I think from a server perspective, Dart could be really good. And it would incentivize me to revisit Steward and remove the reflection and instead move things over to macros, which I think would be really, really nice. Okay, uh, general purpose. Uh, you're gonna have to bear with me because uh, there are six categories and I'm not using six different languages. So I'll just mention where they're repeated. 
Uh, Go is fantastic. Uh, it's still one of the best languages I've used. I have minor, minor nitpicks about Go, um, and mostly it's it's about error handling. Uh, I like that it forces you to code for errors. You can't um, have a situation where something's just thrown and the caller doesn't really know about it. Uh, I like that. I wish it was more strict. Um, it's not, uh, and that's okay. Um, but for me, I, I I do wish it was more strict. That's really my only nitpick. Uh, anything else about Go I really like. Um, it's fast. It's pretty performant. Uh, it's fast to work with. It's fast to build. Um, it runs just about everywhere. You can compile binaries really, really easy uh, with it for especially multi-platform. The community support is fantastic. There are tons of Go libraries. There's Go tutorials, Go books, Go meetups, all sorts of great things. It's a fantastic language. Huge fan. Um, and it's what I plan on using for just general purpose programming for the most part. Uh, I'm going to add one more. Um, so Zig is also something I've been exploring a lot. Uh, actually, realistically, I've been using it for CLIs. So let's just put it in CLIs for now. Um, I had a CLI written in Dino, uh, mostly from an experiment perspective, but the uh, Mac uh, executable was like 56 megabytes and it was doing two things. Uh, so that felt really bad. It was bigger than Git and doing significantly less than Git. Um, so I rewrote it in Zig to see if I could solve that problem and as an opportunity to learn more Zig. Actually, I had been learning it for a while, but I've kind of just been doing one-off things that, that weren't a real project. And I figured I knew the language well enough that it was time to build a project with it. So I migrated that Dino uh, CLI over to Zig, and I was really, really happy with it. The, the Mac binary is like hundreds of kilobytes now. Um, yeah, way better. Uh, so I've been loving it. And in fact, uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is recreating a, uh, or migrating, I should say, a Go CLI over to Zig as well, just to see what it looks like. I have fewer qualms about the Go uh, CLI that I'm talking about. Uh, it's called Book. I think I might have it open in a tab here. Um, eh, maybe not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I do. Okay. Uh, it's called Book. So so what it does is um, it's it's a simple program for managing and opening bookmarks in your terminal. The aim is essentially to be Go links, if you're familiar with that, but for your terminal and your local machine, books backed by a CSV file, making it extremely easy to share bookmarks and manipulate your bookmarks with your own programs as well. Um, so here's the short and sweet. You can This adds a bookmark, so a bookmark called GH that points to GitHub. If you type book GH, it opens GitHub. Um, it uses your machine's... Uh, it switches off your architecture, or your OS, I should say, to determine how it should open the things that you provide to it. So if you're on a Mac, it just calls open on the value that's passed here. So that'll work with like local files, that'll work with web files. If you're on Windows, you know, it uses run 32 DLL for certain things, and then it uses something something else for other things, depending on what you're trying to open. Anyways, that's the gist of it. You can list your bookmarks, you can delete a specific bookmark, you can delete all, you can search um, for specific bookmarks. Uh, and it's stored in like your user config directory. That, that's the point. Um, so I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm rewriting that in Zig, uh, which is, it's been fun. Um, here's what that looks like. You can follow along if you want. If you don't, I don't blame you. Uh, but I want to point out one thing that I think is interesting. So this is, this is the go, um, keep in mind, this is tarred and GZ. So it, it's probably a little bigger than this. Uh, but the sweet, and uh, the short and sweet, the sweet and sour is um, this is pretty small. This is good. I'm I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, it you know really it's a tool for working with CSVs, so it probably shouldn't be that complex or maybe even this big, but that's still pretty small. So when I moved uh, my Dino project, the the main incentive, in fact, you can see kind of here. Uh, migrate to Zig. The file size of the Dino CLI was really starting to bother me, so I decided to pursue rewriting this in Zig to reduce the file size and to learn more about Zig. So I don't have that problem in Go. So I'm not really trying to solve a major problem, but if we look at like the Dino one here, like the uh, Mac uh, ARM, it's technically the, the M1 chips uh, are, you know, it was a 65.6 megabyte executable. And um, that's the smallest of the options that are shipped here. Again, uh, Dino is very different than Zig. Um, you know, we have to ship the runtime with Dino, so we're compiling like Dino down to a potentially smaller size. And there are some options to do this, like building Dino from source as part of the build process and like cutting out Rust debug. It, it, there's, there's options to make this smaller, but it's still not gonna be anywhere near what we got from Zig. 
Uh, so I was really happy with this. Um, that was the impetus for me migrating it. I don't have the same impetus with the, the Go project. Uh, wrong tab. Um, but I do, I do just kind of want to use it as a learning opportunity. I've solved the problem, so I know it works. I know how to solve it. And now I just have to translate that syntax from Go to Zig and then, then do it idiomatically, uh, which is a great way to learn new things. Okay, uh, so web. Uh, yeah, web, TypeScript. Um, specifically, uh, Svelte Kit, probably. Um, I, I don't know what else I would use at this point. Uh, I have a couple apps in Svelte Kit that I'm pretty pretty happy with. So I've got uh, courses.bradcypher.com, uh, which these are both free. So if you would like to learn any of these things, they're completely free. This is for super beginners. If you're watching this video and uh, you know it was sent to you, or sorry, if you stumbled upon this from the algorithm, you probably don't need this. Um, but if you, you know, don't know how to code at all and you want to build a personal web page, uh, there's a free course there. Um, and then them and, and truth be told, I, I pulled this up because I'm also hoping to do more with this website over the next year. Um, so I'll be cross posting some stuff, uh, and you'll be able to find more free courses here. Um, let's see. So yeah, that's TypeScript. That's SvelteKit. Uh, that's, um, you know, available on the internet. I have a couple other SvelteKit projects I'm working on, um, if I'm just doing web stuff, I, Svelte Kit's fantastic. I, I really like it. It's uh, Svelte Five is a little weird. I'm still undecided how I feel about it. Um, most of the community seems to really dislike it. I don't think I share those same feelings, but I do think it has simplified some things and made more thing some things more complex. And uh, I'm not not 100 sure how I feel about those trade offs that it made. Um, that being said. Uh, I'm not going to use JavaScript for any web stuff because TypeScript seems like a better option for me. Um, but I am also curious. I've done some WebAssembly stuff with Go, and I'm also curious about doing some WebAssembly stuff with Zig. So that that also may be in the future as well. Uh, those are the four languages I mentioned. So I'm just going to move these around, take a mental screenshot of this since we can't duplicate these. Um, but I'll move a couple of these around. So for servers, it'll probably be Go. I have been doing some stuff with Dino. I have a project in Dino called Dust. Uh, github.com slash dust books, uh, repositories, dust server. Um, so this is uh, essentially, this is kind of like Plex, but for ebooks and comics. Um, I'll, you'll probably see more videos on this going forward too, uh, because it's, you know, something I've been spending a fair chunk of my time on. Um, so uh, that's, that's a server written from scratch in Dino. Um, it's fine. Uh, it's been enjoyable. Uh, Go is still my go-to for servers. It's so easy. Um, it's easy to run anywhere. It's it's fast. It's really just a, a great time. Uh, and then I, on the embedded side, um, part of the reason that I wanted to learn Zig to begin with was uh, embedded systems. So I've got a couple smaller microcontrollers around my house that I have, and I would love to provision them to do new things. Um, I don't really want to write C. I don't enjoy Rust very much. Uh, I don't really want to write C++. Um, anything else on the list? No, I don't think so. I mean, I guess I could maybe do a similar instructions, which sounds awful. But um, yeah, Zig seems like a happy medium for me to tackle that embedded problem. And that's what got me interested in Zig to begin with. And I haven't even touched it for embedded stuff. I've been learning it for other things. And I've just been enjoying the language so much that I've been throwing it at just about anything I can just to see how it sticks. Um, I've not done any like front end web focused stuff with Zig yet, but I mentioned using it for WebAssembly, so that that may be something you can expect to see on the video in the near future as well, or on the channel in the near future as well. Um, yeah, I think that kind of covers it. I do want to call out a couple things. So on the mobile side, I'm hoping to do more uh, videos of me implementing things in existing projects. My biggest projects I have are Flutter projects, without a doubt. Um, so I'm hoping to do more with that. So I've got, I've got this, uh, this project called Memories of Shoal. It's, uh, it's a game that I've written in Flutter. Um, I don't, do I have it up? I do have it up. Cool. Uh, yeah, so it's a game. So it's got like, you know, a combat system. It's like a, a dark fantasy type thing. There are skills dealing zero damage. That's no good. Um, oh, this is way over leveled for me. Anyways, um, so there's, there's a game with like stats and equipment and monsters with randomly generated traits and, uh, you know, all sorts of fun stuff, music. And, uh, it, it's really cool. And one of the things that I was really excited about is I built this from scratch with no game engine. Um, in hindsight, the, maybe the, after learning about Flutter's game, one of Flutter's game engines called flame, 
Uh, maybe flame would have been great for the combat, but it actually works fine without it too. So I've been been pretty happy with that. But I'm hoping to do more content around this, um, partially because I have competing interests of working on certain projects that are private and uh, creating content for YouTube. And if I can double up the time spent where I am creating content for YouTube using my private projects, um, that that seems like a win-win for me. And I guess really, if someone comes in and, and writes all the exact same code that I have in my multi-thousand file project here, um, by all means, they should they should be able to steal my game from me and publish it. Uh, what else? Um, let's get back to this. Oh yeah, I have another Flutter app that you'll probably see more stuff uh, from me on. So this is called Luna Journal. Um, it sort of doesn't look like this anymore. I probably need to update these pictures. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, my my dog has epilepsy, and we uh, built a tool, or I built a tool to track um, essentially uh, seizure information, medication information, vaccinations, and all of that. Um, for most people, in theory, you you might have a, a more pleasant uh, journal <laughs> than than ours. Um, but the short and sweet is that it's a tool to kind of track that information and then help you send it to your vet uh, whenever it's um, you know something that your vet may care of or care about. There's information on it here. Um, it, it's for free. Uh, it's available for free. Um, the mobile game is not. It's 99 cents uh, USD. Um, but yeah, those are those are out there. So I'm hoping to do more with that, uh, more with Dust on the TypeScript side that we mentioned, more with SvelteKit on the web side. Um, tons of random Zig videos have been taking over my channel lately. Uh, that'll probably stay the case at least for a while. I have yet to find a thing I don't like about Zig, so I've kind of just been churning and burning on Zig projects. And um, yeah, a lot of those produce videos as well because they're open source and, and fun things to kind of talk about. Um, yeah, I think that's just about it. Again, if you're just tuning in at the end of this video, uh, th this is slightly off because there are six topics and there are only four languages for them. So I'll move these back to their existing locations as well. So you can see, um, but yeah, mobile, Dart, Flutter, uh, general purpose, Go, maybe Dart, depending on how macro support turns out in 2025. Um, and maybe even Zig for general purpose. We'll see. CLIs uh, or similar Zig um, also go. Uh, probably not Dart. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where macros go. Um, and then definitely not TypeScript for CLIs. Uh, on the web side, just TypeScript. Uh, specifically TypeScript with SvelteKit. Probably. Uh, I really like SvelteKit. I've mentioned that again. Um, I won't say that again because I feel like I've said it like four times now. But yeah. Uh, that's probably what you can expect on the web side. On the server side, you're probably looking at uh, this. Um, in this order, most of my servers will probably be Go, uh, maybe some Zig stuff as I start to explore that. There's a really cool one called Zap, which wraps a uh, C uh, web framework, uh, facil.io, I believe, um, and uh, exposes it so it's available for Zig. It seems pretty fast and pretty neat. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned Dust, so I've got a TypeScript Dino you know, server from the ground up in Dust that I may end up uh, doing more content on. Um, and then Embedded, just Zig. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's what you can expect to see from my channel in 2025. I hope this is something that you're excited about. These are all tools that I'm very excited about. And, um, yeah, let's learn something together in 2025. Uh, to make sure you don't miss any of that, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. There's a little bell somewhere. I don't know. YouTube's not my forte. But if you click that bell, uh, you'll be notified of any new videos that come out. And then uh, I would really appreciate it if you would like this video and maybe let me know what you're looking forward to learning in the comments below. Thanks, and have a great day.